Hello everyone. I'd like to give a warm welcome to all of you out there. My name is Renee and you're watching Renee's Health Corner. Believe it or not, God really does care about your health. In 2022, just about anywhere you look, sickness is on the rise and diseases are on the rise. And in America, over 4,000 times a day, someone has a heart attack a new diabetic is discovered every 50 seconds, and one out of four people have cancer. That's 25% of the American population. There's also a rise in the number of strokes per year, gastrointestinal problems, lung conditions, lupus, multiple sclerosis, and many other diseases. The question is, why? Many people believe that God is to blame. Is this the case? In 3 John verse 2 in the Bible, we're told that God wants us to prosper and to be in health. So if he wants us to be in health, yet disease is more rampant now than ever before, what's the problem? Well, I'd like to bring something to your mind for just a moment, something that many of us learned in our lives at some point growing up, and that in the world, there's many different types of laws. For instance, um, we have civil law, natural law, the laws of physics, sanitary laws, the laws of gravity. Now take the law of gravity as an example. It's a well-known fact in most cases, what goes up must come down. Well, there are also other laws known as natural laws. And when these laws are neglected in any way, the result is sickness and disease. And over a period of time, neglecting these natural laws, more severe diseases like cancer can set in. So during this video, I'm gonna be discussing um, very simple things um, and tell you about some things that I've learned. And the subject today is going to be on cheese and chocolate. So um, let's get started. Uh, education should be given on proper diet, we're told, in Councils on Diet and Foods, page 406, paragraph four. And Ministry of Healing 127 says, disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. And then we're told to become more intelligent in regard to the laws of life in 11 MR, page 187. And then we're also told that we should educate people in the laws of life. And that's General Conference Daily Bulletin, January 30, 1893, paragraph two. And that's what I'm trying to do, is to educate everyone and let them know about the things that I've learned by studying the Spirit of Prophecy in the Bible and taking medical missionary training classes. Now, why should we educate people? So that they know how to preserve their health. And that's in MM 259, paragraph three. True religion and the laws of health go hand in hand. 7T137, paragraph one. And then KC20, paragraph four says, in violating the laws of health, you misrepresent your maker. And then we're also told in Ministry of Healing, page 128, it is the duty of every person for his own sake and for the sake of humanity to inform himself in regard to the laws of life and conscientiously to obey them. And then we're told in CG, we should educate ourselves not only to live in harmony with the laws of health, but to teach others a better way. And that's CG, uh, page 361. Then in the Bible, in Par uh, Proverbs 26, paragraph 2, it says, The curse causeless shall not come. And Job 29, 16 says, The cause which I knew not, I searched out. So what we have to do is we have to find out which law of health has been violated, remove the violation, pray to God, and then sit back and watch the glory of God. Now, in the spirit of prophecy, again, we're told, when the abuse of health is carried so far that sickness results, the sufferer can often do for himself what no one else can do for him. The first thing to be done is to ascertain the cause and then go to work intelligently to remove the cause. And CD 102 paragraph one says, be sure that as a rational Christian sentinel, you guard the door of your stomach, allowing nothing to pass your lips that will be an enemy to your health and life. And then we're told in LLM, page 545, our food should be plain and free from all objectionable elements. And let us be careful that it is always platable and good. And that's true because I've had people tell me that they were afraid to eat uh, plant-based food because when they had experience with it before, it didn't taste very good. And then once they 
tasted uh, food at my table, they said it was very tasty. So we have to learn how to season things and how to cook and make things platable so that others are impressed and they won't be scared or, you know, against trying to eat the way God wants us to eat. So we're also told in Council on Diet Foods that the idea should never be given, that it is of but little consequence what we eat. And then another quote is in CTBH, it says it is as truly a sin to violate the laws of our being as it is to break the Ten Commandments. To do either is to break God's law. So one, one last Bible quote says, 1 Corinthians 10, 3 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now we can't glorify God when we're putting things in our body that hurt it and harm it and make us sick and get disease or even kill us. The Lord loves us and he doesn't want us to do ourselves harm by following unhelpful recipes. And that's in CD 297. So anyway, we're supposed to dispense entirely with everything hurtful to use and to use judiciously that which is healthful. And that's in Temperance, page 138, paragraph 2. So anyway, let's get started with um, today's topic. And the first topic is cheese. Now, cheese is made from milk and milk almost always contains pus. You can comfort yourself by thinking that the pus is pasteurized and certainly pasteurization will prevent you from becoming ill, but you're still eating pus. And you can look at it like this. You could stick a dog turd in an autoclave and render it biologically harmless with significant pressure and heat, yet we're willing to wager that you'd not be anxious to eat it unless you had some very strange <laughs> dietary tastes. Now, forget about being vegan, uh, cheeses aren't even vegetarian, mostly. A rennet is a stomach enzyme, which is common to most mammals, and it's used to make cheese by digesting it, leaving behind a solid and a liquid. Rennet is often harvested from the stomachs of cattle in slaughterhouses and used directly in cheese. Though there are vegetarian rennet synthesized by other means, it's difficult to know which cheeses use vegetarian rennet and which ones use the stuff scraped out of the stomach of slaughtered animals. And um, cow stomach excretions obviously go great with pus. <laughs> In order for you to have your cheese, someone had to produce the milk to make the cheese. And we don't mean a dairy farmer. The someone in this case is nameless dairy cow identified only by a number and probably a radio frequency identification tag in its ear that helped the slave uh, owner farmer track her productivity so he can send her to the slaughterhouse once she under produces. In the larger dairy operations, the cow may never get to go outside even and get fresh air and sunshine. And she'll repeatedly give birth to calves who will be stolen from her almost immediately after they're born. And she'll live a short and miserable life and end up as a hamburger on the plate of some fast food consumer, all because uh, they couldn't find the guts to stop eating cheese or drinking milk. And then those people say they care about animals. I don't think so. Beyond being a disaster for cows, cheese is a disaster for you. A cup of diced cheddar has a whopping 532 calories, 385 of it which come from fat. That includes 28 grams of saturated fat, which is 139% of the amount recommended for total daily consumption by the U.S. government. And really, do you think that those figures haven't already been magnified by decades of dairy and meat industry intervention in the government? To all that fat, you can add 19 milligrams of cholesterol and 820 milligrams of sodium. For comparison, if you decide to reach for a cup of chopped carrots instead, you'd be taking in fewer than a tenth of the total calories, 52 for the whole cup, and less than 1% of the fat than if you ate the cheese. Now, cheese equals the greatest source of animal fat. It's the number one source of saturated fat in the diet, and 80% of the protein in cheese is from casein, which equals the most powerful cancer promoter. Animal rennet is used to make most cured cheeses, and rennet comes from the digestive system of animals. The stomach of pigs are also used as rennet many times. Now, like I said, there can be other sources of rennet, but mostly it is pig. 
And so we're told in the Spirit of Prophecy in Council on Diet and Foods, page 368, that chi should never be introduced into the stomach. Then we're told on um, the next paragraph that cheese is still more objectionable. It is wholly unfit for food. Did you hear that? It's unfit for food. So we shouldn't even be eating it because it's not even really food. And then we're told on page 236 of the same book, the effect of cheese is deleterious. Now, children are allowed to eat, you know, things like flesh meat, spices, butter, cheese, pork, rich pastries and condiments. And we're told these things do their work of deranging the stomach, exciting the nerves, uh, enfeebling the intellect, and parents don't even realize what they're doing. And you can find that in uh, Council on Diet Foods, page 350. I paraphrased it. Um, again, a direct quote from CTBH is flesh meats, butter, cheese, um, rich pastry, spice foods, and condiments are freely partaken of both by young and old. And these things do their work in deranging the stomach, exciting the nerves, and enfeebling the intellect. The blood-making organs cannot convert such things into good blood. So the, consum the consumption of cheese also can contribute to cancer, clogged arteries, colon problems, constipation, diabetes, heart disease, high cholesterol, obesity, polyps, and much, much more. Now, the drawbacks of cheese outweigh any benefits that it might have. Cheese is a putrefied product. It's basically rotten milk, and it's high in bacteria. Fresh cheese can contain as much as 90 to 140,000 microbes. Some cheeses are even bleached, and they have synthetics added to them, and some have harmful dyes added to them, and the cheese contains casein. It's very difficult to digest. It uh, the average American today consumes 20 pounds of cheese every single year. And in 1910, they only ate about five pounds. Now it takes 10 pounds of milk to make one pound of cheese. That tells you how concentrated it is too. Uh, now the putrefactive process, which cheese undergoes, results in the production of uh, ammonia irritating fatty acids. And the carbohydrate is converted to lactic acid. These are all waste products that cause irritation to nerves and the gastrointestinal intestinal tract. Um, migraine headaches can be caused by eating cheese and uh, certain of the amines can interact with the nitrates present in the stomach uh, to form a cancer producing agent called nitrosamine. And intolerance to lactose which is the chief carbohydrate of cheese and milk, is probably the most common food sensitivity in America. Many, many people are lactose intolerant. Now, if you go to the pioneer section on the uh, Ellen White CD-ROM, our pioneers even told us that cheese wasn't good for us. And um, one quote is, uh, cheese is not suitable for food for man. While it contains uh, desirable food elements, these have associated with them undesirable substances, which are irritating and produce a feverish state of the system. And then it says, we may take food that is already poisonous, such as cheese, for instance, a very small piece of cheese contains millions of germs and germ poisons. It is simply decayed milk. And that's February 11, 1895, uh, N slash A GCB 92.1. And then, um, February 15, 1895, uh, N slash A, GBC 170.9 says cheese always contains germs in great numbers. When six weeks old, a bit of cheese as large as a grain of wheat contains thousands of germs. These germs increase as the cheese becomes older. Wow. But one says, I have eaten cheese my whole life and it never hurt me. If you have not been able to notice the injurious effect of it, it is because your liver has been able to um, destroy the poison. These injurious practices may sometimes be carried on for a long time, but there comes a time by and by when the overwork system fails and the health is gone. And that's February 11, 1895, N slash A, GBC 92.2. And... Um, Another uh, quote is prosecuting attorney had received a letter from a leading firm of a wholesale cheese dealer calling his attention to the vast amount of adulteration by the cheese manufacturers. And the letter stated that there was a hundred or more cheese manufacturers in the state who were making adulterated cheese. 
and it was filled with lard and neutral uh, cotton seeds and other oils. The complaint is made that the market is being flooded with this stuff, which is made in close imitation of the best creamy and dairy products. And then another quote says, a man once came to me and said, if the stomach has to disinfect the food, why not eat cheese if you have plenty of gastric juice to disinfect it with? But if the stomach makes gastric juice to render wholesome ordinary food, it ought not to have the extra burden of unwholesome food. And if this be long continued, of course the stomach will thereby be weakened. And that's February 19, 1897, N slash A, GCDB 93.4. Anyway, Sister White didn't use cheese as a food for years, and she said in Councils on Diet and Foods, page 370, in regard to cheese, I am now quite sure we have not purchased or placed on our table cheese for years. We never think of making cheese an article of diet, much less buying it. And then uh, CD, page 491, says our fare is simple and wholesome. We have on our table no butter, no meat, no cheese, no greasy mixtures of food. And so... The question whether we shall eat butter, meat, or cheese is not to be presented to anyone as a test, but we are to educate and to show the evils of the things that are objectionable. Now, why some of God's people still eat it? Well, your responsible men in the office are not reformers. They eat cheese because that's what they choose to do, basically. People want what they like and they don't wanna give it up because they enjoy the taste of it. Trust me. Cheese was one of the hardest things for me to give up because I grew up in a tiny little town where we had our own cheese factory and that was the best cheese I've ever eaten in my life. Now I haven't eaten cheese for many, many years, over 30 years, but that was the best cheese ever. And I used to, uh, when I moved away, grew up, moved away, I used to have my grandma send me it in the mail so I could have it in my home and eat it. It was delicious. And in fact, that place is still in business. They've been in business over 50 years, but I never touch the stuff anymore. I make my own plant-based cheeses from scratch and they are delicious and we've learned to love them. Now here's a powerful quote. The Sabbath is, is um, oh, excuse me, it was decided at a certain camp meeting that cheese should not be sold to those on the ground. But on coming to the ground, Dr. Kellogg found that to his surprise, a large quantity of cheese had been purchased for sale at the grocery. He and some others had objected to this, but those in charge of the grocery said that the cheese had been bought with the consent of a brother and that they could not afford to lose the money invested in it. So upon this, Dr. Kellogg asked the price of the cheese and he bought the whole of it from them and he had traced the matter from cause to effect and knew that some foods generally thought to be wholesome were very injurious. Okay, so that's uh, my information on cheese. Now I'm gonna give you some information on chocolate. Chocolate is a very acidic food and we're told in, uh, in August 24, 1899, um, EJW uh, PTUK, page 541, paragraph eight says, if people drank only at the right time, there would be far less drinking of substances that are injurious. For it is a fact that the greater portion of the tea, coffee, chocolate, which ought never to be drunk, and that is um, saying that you should never put it in your mouth, basically. And then it says, but you drink cocoa and chocolate? No, I have no use for them. For while they contain a little food, they contain more that is injurious. The Chief Inspector of Foods and Drugs for the County of Durham says that many cheap chocolate sweetmeats contain paraffin wax, which has a tendency when eaten to bring on appendicitis. The absolutely safe way is never to composite, eat, never to eat composite things of any kind. And this is all from um, the Pioneer section. Now, we're gonna talk about the problems that chocolate causes. It causes agitation, anxiety, cancer, depression, discomfort, respiratory problems, um, uh, hormonal problems, fatigue, fluid retention, GI problems, headaches, heart disease, imperfect balance, insomnia, irritability, uh, palpitations, restlessness, uh, tachycardia, tremors, and vertigo. Now, here's some facts about chocolate from uh, a book uh, by a Seventh-day Adventist lady named Gwen Shorter. And in her manual, pages 86 through 87, she says, chocolate is a solid semi-plastic food prepared by finely grinding cocoa. 
it must have a minimum of 50% fat, and it must have a large amount of sugar and milk added to it to make it even platable because it's so bitter. Chocolate contains tannins, which have been implicated in certain cancers of the digestive tract. Caffeine content can be as high as 112 milligrams per cup of cocoa, and chocolate can interfere with calcium absorption. Chocolate must be fermented for three to eight days, at which time peak uh, fermentation, concentrates of bacteria and mold are present aflatoxin, the cancer producing agent in the molds of cocoa beans. Uh, fermentation produces what you call the chocolate flavor. Now in the tropical regions in which it grows while it's fermenting, chocolate is um, or has insects, rodents, and small animals and many types of contamination that occurs. Um, and now in another booklet published by the U.S. Department of Health and Education and Welfare entitled The Food Defect Action Levels, uh, spe um, Specifications Listing of Curtain Levels for Natural or Unavoidable Defects in Food, lists the natural defect levels in chocolate in the form of insects, rodent, and other natural contaminants that are allowed by the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration. So... Also allowed on chocolate and chocolate liqueur used in the manufacture of such products as chocolate bars, up to 120 insect fragments per cup or two and rodent hairs per cup. Now, how many of you want that in your food? I don't. 4% of cocoa beans may be infested with insects and still carry the blessing of the FDA. Did you hear that? 4% of cocoa beans may be infested with insects and still carry the blessing of the FDA. Visible or solid animal excreta must not exceed 10 milligrams per pound. For chocolate powder or pressed cakes, there must not be more than 75 insect fragments in three tablespoons of powder. Wow. When I first heard that, I was done with chocolate. I couldn't eat it anymore. And now um, women are advised to discontinue um, the use of coffee, tea, colas, and chocolate and all forms of, uh, of, of things like that because they are, have, uh, can cause breast cancer. And many physicians believe the effect on the male prostate is similar and even on the female um, breast, as I said before. Caffeine is technically a drug. Here's some facts about it. When you drink caffeine, it pulls water out of your system. We need to drink eight to 12 glasses of water per day. Well, it depends on your weight. You're supposed to really drink half your weight in ounces, uh, which I will do a, a video on that sometime on water. And um, our body is 80% water, so we need to drink more water. One of the organs most rapidly affected by caffeine is our brain. Almost 99% of the caffeine that is filtered by the kidneys is reabsorbed. Caffeine must be metabolized to be eliminated from the body. Caffeine affects many of our body's organs. It constricts the blood vessels, speeds up the heart, and stimulates the brain, uh, stomach, kidneys, ovaries, and testes. Symptoms of excessive caffeine include sleep disturbances, headache, tremors, jitterness, anxiety, lightheadedness, irritability, depression, a rapid heartbeat, skipped heartbeats, rapid breathing, diarrhea, stomach pains, heartburn, frequent urination, and muscular tension. Satan, here's a quote from Review and Herald, September 8, 1874. Satan well knows that it is impossible for man to discharge his obligations to God and to his fellow men while he impairs the faculties God has given him. The brain is the capital of the body. If the perceptive faculties become benumbed through intemperance of any kind, eternal things are not discerned. So what do you use in the place of chocolate, you might be wondering? Well, what we do is we use carob. Now carob belongs to the legume family. And the same family that gives you lentils and split peas also gives you a seed in a pod that has a chocolate flavor. Uh, with nutritional benefits instead of liabilities. And um, the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins and his mint was locusts and wild honey. That's in Matthew um, chapter 3, par uh, verse 4. Carob comes from a pod born by a certain type of locust tree. John the Baptist's complete vegetarian diet was an important aid to his spiritual perception. 
On account of his acute discernment in spiritual things, he recognized Jesus as the Messiah. God is calling his people to health reform in order that they might be prepared for Jesus' second coming. And care rather than chocolate is part of that reform. We are being given the same choice as was John the Baptist concerning diet. May God quicken our perception as we follow the better way. Now, many people th like to say that John the Baptist was eating bugs, locust bugs. No, he was not. He was eating carob. And God told us, you know, that I, he has given us every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, and to you it shall be for meat. Carob is an excellent source of calcium, potassium, pectin, fiber. It contains iron, vitamins A, B1, and B3. It does not contain any of the bad things like chocolate does, and it contains 2,000 less, 2,000 2, times less theobromine, which is a stimulant similar to caffeine. It contains about 50 times less fat and three to four times fewer calories than chocolate. Since carob is naturally sweet and chocolate is naturally bitter, much less sweetener is needed with carob. Carob does not aggravate skin problems, cause digestive problems, or cause allergic reactions as chocolate often does. Don't get the idea that carob tastes exactly like chocolate. Chocolate has its familiar taste because of the large amount of fat and sugar that's added to it. And those are very unhealthful for you, even in small quantities. Carob has a slightly different taste than chocolate, but personally, I have grown to love carob. I used to be very addicted to chocolate and I ate chocolate a lot, but I can tell you that I am so over it and I would never ever touch it again. But carob is really delicious. Now you have to know how to prepare it and, and what to do with it because people have made things with carob that have not tasted very well. I had a lady tell me recently that she never liked carob until she tried my one of my carob treats I gave her. Now anyway, if a recipe calls for um, cocoa, you know, you can substitute it with carob powder. Um, or if a, a recipe calls for um, the unsweetened chocolate, you can substitute carob in that by mixing two tablespoons of hot water with three tablespoons of carob powder. And that would be the equivalent for a one ounce square of unsweetened chocolate. Now, um, you can wean your family off of chocolate, you know, you don't have to do it right away, but you can use like three fourths chocolate and one fourth carob and don't tell them and see if they notice. And then, you know, do that for whatever, a week or whatever, you know. And then the next time, um, do half and half. And then the next time, a fourth and three-fourths until you're only using carob and they probably won't even know the difference. Now, we're told uh, in CDF 334, the dessert should be placed on the table and served with the rest of the food. For often after the stomach has been given all it should have, dessert's brought on and that's just too much. So let's obey God's plan to eat healthy. We wouldn't put sugar in our gas tank or pop in our transmission, so let's not put caffeine in our bodies when God has told us not to. Now may God bless you as you strive to feed your body healthy according to his plan. And you know, God made our bodies and he knows what's best for it. Now, I'm gonna give you a little recipe here um, that's no dairy and no chocolate. And it's what you do is you take two small ripe avocados uh, one third to one half cup of honey or maple syrup, a uh, quarter cup of carob powder, two tablespoons of coconut milk or rice milk, or you can just use almond milk, uh, a little pinch of salt, and um, a pinch of, uh, of a cinnamon substitute. I use coriander and cardamom. I do uh, three to one, more coriander than cardamom because cardamom is pretty strong. Now, all you do is put this in a blender or a food processor and you blend it on high until it's really smooth and then chill it and then serve it. It's really delicious. You can even make a pie with it. You know, have your pie crust ready, put that in it and boom, you have a pie. Well, anyway, that's our time for today. I hope that what you've heard on here will be a blessing to you and your family. And until we meet again, may the good Lord bless and keep you throughout the, um, the new week coming up. And remember, God loves you and he wants you to be in health. So eat that which is good.